for another Gab with Abigail. If you aren't back and this is your first time on my channel, hi, welcome to Gabs with Abigail where we talk about the Bates and Duggars and other D-list fundies. Today we are continuing growing up Duggar with chapter two, your relationship with your parents. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Chapter two, your relationship with your parents, love, respect, and communication. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long. Exodus 20, verse 12. We get a lot of letters and emails from girls who watch 19 Kids and Counting, and many of them ask our advice on tough issues. We don't pretend to have all the answers to difficult situations some of these girls are going through, but in this book, we want to share what we've learned and what we've experienced that might relate to their questions. Most important, we pray for the girls who share their hearts with us. A lot of the girls have written to us about the pain caused by their dad abandoning their family or their parents getting a divorce. Others are still living under the same roof, but there is so much strife, contention, and anger. Our dad has shared that when he was growing up, his dad did not have a spiritual focus. And because of that, his father often did not have the right attitudes and responses. This caused a lot of problems in his family. They struggled financially and had the utilities temporarily shut off many times. At one point, their house was foreclosed on. But his mother was a strong woman of faith who consistently encouraged dad and his older sister to trust the Lord no matter what came their way. Dad said that he tried to pick out his dad's good qualities and apply them to his life, Things like sales ability and a giving heart, but leave out the bad qualities. He also looked up to other godly men in his church as role models. Romans 8 verse 28 became dad's life first. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. This means that as we trust God, he will work all situations to turn out for eventual good in our lives. So instead of getting angry and upset when things don't go our way, we need to thank God and look for the benefits that can come from the situation. He has promised that even the seemingly bad will work out for good. As a result of dad's childhood, one obvious benefit was that he gained great faith in God. There were a few times when his family honestly didn't know where their next meal would come from. But his mom would encourage them to pray, and he saw God answer their prayers countless times. This caused him to develop a spiritual focus at a young age. Also, with his father not striving to be a spiritual leader in his life, Dad determined early on that by God's grace, he would become a godly husband and father to his own family one day. I say it all the time, I say it all the time, that all of this is a result of Jim Bob being traumatized by his childhood, by his father, and never getting to have the right therapist. But I digress. Dad's background has also given him sensitivity towards others who have given up, who have grown up in similar situations. Our parents have led our family to reach out to those around us who for one reason or another don't have a mom or dad. As we've reached out, we have truly felt that we have received the greater blessing in return through the love others have shown us. Mom's dad spent most of his growing up years in an orphanage. Despite that rough beginning, he chose not to go through life feeling sorry for himself or to wallow in depression, but rather to live cheerfully and encourage those around him. I always love this stuff like this, like this toxic positivity as if everybody can do this. Like everybody's orphan situation was the same as this man's and could just choose joy. He became a very tender-hearted man and a hard worker. He got promoted into management at a large machine shop and eventually took a job that moved his family from Cincinnati, Ohio to Springdale, Arkansas when mom was four years old. He determined to become a loving father and he and his wife ended up having seven children. Our mom is the seventh. This goes to show that no matter what kind of family situation you grow up in, God can use you to make God can use it to make you stronger. 
And as you resolve to develop a genuine love and servant's heart towards your family, you will see God begin to work in their hearts as well. So yeah, just again, like this, this toxic positivity. Of like, see, if they can do it, honey, you don't have an excuse. If they can do it, you could do it too. And that also they were growing up in a completely different economy. The minimum wage now is the same as it was when Jim Bob was bagging groceries or doing cans, whatever the hell he used to do at that grocery store. Boundaries. Some parents are a little on the strict side. Others are more laid back. But it is important for each of us to realize that our parents love us. Even though parents make mistakes and are not perfect, it's important that we honor and respect them. As we get older and show signs of maturity, we gain more freedoms, but with greater freedom comes greater responsibility. For years, our parents have invested in our lives and mentioned and mentored us with the goal of sending us out into the world to make a difference. We've received letters from girls whose parents want to be cool, so they avoid telling their kids no. Those parents probably assume their teenagers are mature enough to set their own appropriate boundaries and make wise choices. But we know from our own experience that young teenagers often don't have the maturity needed for making decisions, especially for deciding issues that can carry lifelong impact. We made plenty of poor decisions as teenagers, and while we're thankful our parents gave us increasing freedom to decide tough issues for ourselves, as we matured, we're also grateful they didn't just turn us loose to decide everything independently as soon as we turned 13 or even 18. Instead, they have given us plenty of guidance and have provided a solid foundation during our growing up years. When each of us children learn to read, they encourage us to read and study the Bible. And as we grew, they encouraged us to start thinking about the convictions and guidelines God would have us set for ourselves. In this chapter, we're going to talk about how they did that. The hottest hot topic. One of the biggest issues teenage girls focus on is boys, in particular, one boy. I'm a hot girl, I do hot girl shit, so I've got more than one boy, but you're right, okay, let's, let's, let's keep it classy. At least, that's what girls tell us in letters that usually say something like, there's this boy. We get the feeling that the world thinks strained relationships between teenage girls and their parents occur most often because the girl wants to date a certain boy and the parents say no. Usually, it's because the girl is too young or because the boy isn't good enough for their daughter. And certainly, we get letters from girls and parents in those situations, so we know that's often the case. But we have also received several letters from girls who wish their parents would have provided more boundaries for them when they were dating. Surprising, but true. Before we go any further, we need to clarify that none of us girls actually plans to date as most people would define dating. And like, even just that, like I hate that so much, like as most people would define dating, most people define dating as like, yes, you're trying to hope that it leads to marriage. Like that's, most people do. Most people hope that their relationship that they enter works out. Like even when you're in high school, and sure it's because of the immature feelings that you might, you know, have, most people want it to work out with the person they enter a relationship with and like, that it lasts forever because that's what love is a very strong, powerful feeling. Like those romantic emotions are strong. So just this annoying, just blanket statement that came out of IBLP, out of IFB, that's Independent Fundamental Baptist circles that dating is this flippant, casual thing. Like, I'm so sorry that you guys were just this traumatized by the 60s and 70s, but baby, please pack it up. It happened. Find the right counselor. Everybody needs to find the right therapist. Immediately. Immediately. If marriage is in God's future plans for any of us, we desire for our relationships with our future husbands to develop through courtship. 
rather than today's norm of dating. We'll talk more about that in chapter five. But for now, we want to focus on a teenage girl's relationship with her parents as she becomes aware of teenage boys and starts thinking about dating or courtship. Here's the bottom line. The relationship a girl has with her dad often influences how she will relate to boys. What do you guys think? Do you guys think that's true? I feel like I have like cousins, I feel like I've said this before, who like they kind of date their the type that I've seen them date reminds me of their father. And I wouldn't say that's like necessarily a bad thing because I could see why that's the kind of partner that they would want in terms of like, like I could see why, like, you know, if you have a really good relationship with your father, you see a lot of those good qualities. Why wouldn't you want that in a partner later down the line? I think it just gets creepy for people that it's like, you want to date your father, but it's like, and I'll insert the clip and hopefully they don't demonetize me, but like that, seen from bringing up Bates when Aaron and Tori were like, I want to date a guy like my dad. Or the Duggar girls having the picture of Jim Bob in their bedroom from when he was younger. Like, okay. Like, I think it's one thing for that to be kind of like a natural thing that happens. Um, and then quite another to be like actively encouraging that. I don't know. It's a little bit weird to me, but... To each his own. <laughs> Girls want to believe that their dads love them and will protect them. When they don't feel that, they often go searching for those things from guys. This can lead to unwise decisions, which can turn, which in turn brings a host of consequences and painful memories. One young woman who wrote to us desperately wanted her father to at least check out the boys who wanted to date her, but he didn't. When a boy came to pick her up at home, her dad would send her on her way with the words, have a good time. Maybe that seems like every teenage girl's dream, a dad who lets her do whatever she wants or go out with any guy she wants to date. But when we reached out to mentor this girl, she told us that as she and the boy of the week would drive away, she might have been smiling on the outside, but inside she felt empty, worthless not even important enough for her father to bother checking out the boy who was taking her out. Children grow up seeing what their parents value. We are grateful to have parents whose faith in Jesus is their top priority. They value their relationship with him. And second to that, they cherish their relationship with each other and with their family. A girl watches what her father takes care of his sports car, his custom-made golf clubs, his investments. It's unlikely that a dad would entrust his prized convertible to a teenage boy he didn't really know and just let the kid take it out for a spin without supervision. But the same dad may let a relatively unknown boy drive off with his daughter without giving it much thought. I get this analogy, I do, but there are just really sometimes in certain situations where I think we should recognize that it's inappropriate to be comparing real breathing people to inanimate objects. Because I just really, I do think that there's a difference. Like I do get the point and I do understand that because this is a very true statement, right? You, um, um, you wouldn't just let some man off the street take your car out, but your car also can't drive itself your car can't make itself break, right? Your car um, can't tell you if the person was speeding. You know what I mean? But like your child can. Like a, your child can tell a boy, no, don't touch me that way. Your child can say, no, we're not going to go here at this place. If you're raising your child right, they should know. You should have given them a curfew about what time they should be back home. And I think um, that that's the difference, that your child can speak and has feelings and has emotions that you can try and respect. Um, and I just feel like for this girl, honey, just go talk to your father and tell him that I would like for you to check out these boys. It, it matters to me. Like clearly you place an important value on this relationship with your father. And I'm sure it's not of a place of not loving you. Like we just spent a whole chapter, I think, oh no, we're about to get into that. <laughs> but like about how important it is to, to open up and talk to your parents and not to assume that they can read your mind. 
Like, if this is something that's bothering you, tell your dad that. Say, like, hey, dad, I really want you to check out this guy. It's really important to me. Blah, blah, blah. Like, your father might think these are temporary teenage crushes and that therefore he doesn't have to take it serious. Or that he knows where you guys are going and, and, he, or that he, and he trusts you and therefore he trusts your judgment. And that's okay if you feel like, oh, that's not good enough for me. That doesn't make me feel cared about. Then just tell him that. You know what I mean? But again, I just feel like there are certain times like it's a child. And again, there's this idea that's strong within within people in general, I want to say, like that your children are your possession. I mean, they belong to you in the sense that it's your responsibility to take care of them and nurture them and things like that. But the idea of trying to compare it to like a car I don't know. I don't think that that's appropriate. And I get it. It's common. Anybody could make this. I'm not trying to pick on the Duggar girls, but I just feel like as a society, we should kind of recognize better when we maybe shouldn't be comparing people to things. Like we should really do a better job of picking and choosing when that is in fact appropriate. That dad may think he's being a great understanding father who wants to make his daughter happy, but instead he may be striking a severe blow to that daughter's self-esteem. It's easy for her in that situation to think she's not good enough, not important enough to be loved. And that kind of thinking can make her vulnerable to the first boy who tells her he loves her and wants to share that love through a physical relationship. I want you to know that there are plenty of girls who have loving fathers who check out their, the guys beforehand who still feel pressured to have a physical relationship with a boy. It happens. Cause when you're 15 and somebody tells you they love you, you gotta believe them. I used to always like, I couldn't relate to that song because I absolutely did not have sex in high school, God forbid. Um, but I, the fact that that girl's name, her best friend's name was Abigail, I'm like, oh my God, that's my name. Absolutely not having sex at 15. No, mm -mm. no, no, thank you. But yeah, it really, I don't want it to say that this is the only situation where girls feel that way about themselves. You know, it's just kind of one of those things that can sometimes just be life's growing pains, you know. And also like that it takes away from this idea that girls aren't horny, right? I, I know that girls might want to have sex too. <laughs> the girl may so yearn to feel value and accepted by a male that she gives in to the boy's desires. Again, just this idea that girls don't ever have desires. I get it though. Typically, you know, stereotypically, men are the, are the aggressors. Um, let's have that chat some other day. But too often the boy's love, love for her turns out to be fleeting and the girl is left feeling cast off and degraded. Cause when you're 15, I'm kidding. They could have just put that part into the book. <laughs> Ooh, Taylor Swift, the goat. Okay. From there, things can easily spiral downward as the girl's yearning to feel valued intensifies and she seeks acceptance from the next boy who comes along. Great, I just see that I had the echo on a little bit. <sighs> From there, things can easily spiral downward as the girl's yearning to feel valued intensifies and she seeks acceptance from the next boy who comes along. We hear from a lot of girls in this painful situation. Girls want their dad to be their protector. They want to feel valued by their dad more than any possession he owns. If he doesn't show that he values her, daughters can feel easily devalued, even betrayed. If you're a girl in this situation, we know it's unlikely that you'll go to your father and say, Dad, I'd like you to be stricter when it comes to dating. But we encourage you to pray about your relationship with your dad and ask God to give him those characteristics he's missing or to give him insights that will help him improve his relationship with you. I thought this was an interesting thing because I would say I don't have a good relationship with my father. And... Um, I'll get more into that, I guess. I think maybe somewhere later in this chapter because I did already read it. But I don't have a good relationship with my father and I have never thought to pray for him and his characteristics that he's missing. Um, 
and to give him insights that will help improve his relationship with me. And I think that that's actually very good advice um, to kind of release the burden of the feelings on yourself to ask God to help improve that person's life and to kind of remove yourself a little bit from that situation of like, that is out of my hands. It's actually not my responsibility to necessarily go out and improve my relationship with him, which even though Jill's about to encourage me to do just that, (laughs) but to, but just in general that like, that's something I'm trying to be better at this year of not holding a grudge. I can really hold a grudge. I can really hold a grudge. I'm a, I'm an extremely sensitive person, which I feel like most people don't know about me because I'm so introverted. So, but I'm like, but obviously to me in my mind, that should scream that I'm probably sensitive. <laughs> but, and so, but that's, I've never thought to like pray for him. And in a sense to help me to be less angry about it. And I think that's really good advice, personally. You let me know what you think. And then do your part. Show respect when your dad makes hard decisions. Don't argue or pout when he sets guidelines for your family. And watch for opportunities to spend time with your dad and talk with him, knowing that close communication can strengthen your relationship. For me, it's going to stop at the praying, personally. For me, it's going to stop at the praying. The importance of love and respect. Of course, sometimes things happen in families that make communication difficult, if not impossible. We hear from girls whose families struggle with a wide range of challenges in their parents, alcoholism, drug addiction, physical abuse, or the absence of a parent due to death or divorce. We're barely more than teens ourselves and in these situations we don't have the professional training to give these girls the kind of emergency assistance they need so in those cases we urge girls to reach out to a trusted adult the other parent a pastor or a pastor's wife a sunday school teacher or christian counselor so not a real therapist babe (laughs) or a guidance counselor social worker the police, since we mentioned physical abuse. Meanwhile, we can pray for their safety and emotional well-being, and we can offer a listening ear as they pour out the cries of their hearts. I enjoy them being honest that they are not equipped for those kinds of situations. You know, that transparency, that that asterisk, (laughs) that protection of self. When safety isn't an issue and communication is broken, we share what we know about healing the rift. Again, we're certainly not experts in family counseling, but we've grown up in a family that strives to make good, honest communication a top priority, and we're glad to share some things we've learned over the years if it can be of help. An opportunity to do this that came along not too long ago when one of my Jill's friends called me with the devastating news that her dad was leaving the family and her parents were getting a divorce. We cried together as she sobbed out her heartache. She has given me permission to share her story in hopes that it can benefit others in similar situations. As one of the older children in her family, she felt a huge responsibility to set an example of loving encouragement for her younger siblings, but that seemed impossible when she was battling so many emotions herself. When she tried to talk with her dad about his leaving, and tell them how hurt she and her siblings were, the conversation ended with both of them exploding in anger. She and her dad both said things they probably wish they hadn't said. As the days turned into weeks and then months, we continued to talk frequently, but it didn't seem that her relationship with her dad could ever be reconciled. Every time we talked, I told her I would be praying for her, and particularly for her relationship with her father. But it seemed that she and her dad were growing further apart. It is super ironic that this is Jill's section. God be knowing. God be knowing, huh? When the divorce was finalized, it included mandatory visitation for the dad with all the children. But because of the strained relationship between my friend and her dad, he said he wouldn't force her to come. It's up to you, he told her. Maybe her dad meant well by not forcing her, 
but his words hurt her deeply. By leaving it up to her, her dad seemed to be saying he didn't care about his daughter. At least that's how it felt to her. On the outside, my friend seemed tough and acted like it didn't hurt. But on the inside, she was heartbroken, and often when we talked on the phone, the tears came pouring out. Despite the pain, she knew her relationship with her father was important, and she knew in her heart that her dad felt the same way. They just didn't seem to know how to get past all the hurt. Then, out of the blue, months after their big blow-up, when he left the family, the girl's dad invited her and her siblings to go to a ball game with him, but again, he let her know she didn't have to go if she didn't want to. My friend and I talked about her dad's invitation and she acknowledged that it meant her dad was still trying to have a relationship with her. He hadn't given up even though it seemed like he didn't care. The girl decided to go even though her heart was still full of so much pain and bitterness towards her dad that she was afraid it would come rushing out and damage their relationship even more. But the truth was, she missed her dad and longed to spend time doing fun things with him the way they had done before the divorce. When she asked for my advice on how to handle this situation with her dad, I told her I didn't know what it was like to be in a family split by divorce, but I know the feeling of wanting to have healthy family relationships. This is a Josh illusion. I encouraged the girl to honor her dad because despite her hurt feelings, he is still her father. Everyone wants to be respected, but it's especially important for fathers. So? I don't know. Like, I get in this situation, I don't feel like her father did anything really crazy, you know? But I just think about, like, me and my life. <laughs> or, like, I just think about me and my life and, like, my father said something. I haven't talked to my father in like maybe four or five years. And maybe actually maybe five or six. So, and the reason is because he said something to me that was really, really, really disrespectful. And kind of unforgivable to me. And basically, I think what like started it was like, he called me, I don't know if this happened, but this is one thing that happened. I think he called me and I accidentally picked it up. It was like really, really early in the morning and I didn't mean to pick up the phone. So I like picked it up and hung up or something like that. I don't even think anybody got to say hello, any of that. And he like sent me a text message that was like, oh, you must think I'm your man for, um, that you can hang, you know, hang up on me like that. Like basically saying I was being disrespectful. And I think what was like so like funny to me, like uh, part of why I was like so angry because more came, I think, after that. I think this was the same day. But that he said that he would say that kind of thing when at that point in my life, I had never had a boyfriend ever. Like never had a boyfriend. And... To think, like, and that just to me, like, it's one of those things where it, the, what he said was so basic, but it hurt on the deeper level of, like, as my father, you know me, that you know me, like, you know so little about me. You have such little of a relationship with me that you don't know that I've never had a boyfriend. As a father, as a man, like, you don't feel ashamed and embarrassed by that, but, like, and even if he doesn't, it's that how painful that is for me as a daughter, you know? talking about this, that that is never, you have never been involved in, in my life enough to know that kind of thing. So like the idea that just by virtue that he is my father, he deserves to be my parent or that he deserves to be respected, that I owe him that. Like, oh, he's still my father. In what regard? Genetically? There was one time, like I had a visitation with my father. I was like 16 and I realized that like, and he realized this too, that I didn't know what to call him, that I felt uncomfortable. I didn't know if to call him dad, daddy, papi. Um, that's what Haitians call, some Haitians call their father. Or like, um, you know, pops. 
and, and or by just his um i think we came to, like the consensus he told me to call like i call him by his first name but like how how you're not embarrassed by that like so this idea that like to honor my father now obviously in this situation this girl has an established relationship with her father that is father daughter but just the idea that this isn't advice for everybody clearly you know what i mean like i don't think it's enough to just say that because this is your parent you should respect them why I suggested that to begin improving their relationship, the first thing she needed to do was work on being positive. If she felt like she was going to say something critical or negative, I advised her that it would be better, at least for now, to choose not to say anything. Along with this goal, I encouraged her to pray for her dad and ask God to help him have more patience and kindness and to pray that he would be slow to anger, a phrase that occurs several times in the Bible describing a characteristic of God. And like I said, I know I said, oh, I think that's good advice to be praying for your parent, like your parent to develop better character qualities. But I said that from a, I'm saying that from the perspective of like, I don't speak to my father. <laughs> so I'm praying that for you. Like I'm praying that for you. The Bible teaches that whenever we encounter those who are troubled by harmful character qualities, I'm telling you the Gothard. Things like anger, dishonesty, impatience, vanity, we should pray that God will help them to be will help them to develop the opposite quality. Things like a peaceful demeanor, truthfulness, patience, and humility. I shared these suggestions with the girl and we prayed together that God would help her dad replace his negative character qualities with positive ones. We also asked God to do the same thing for the girl replacing her anger with respect and courtesy you know maybe this is the issue like i'm gonna call my mom be like maybe we haven't been praying for my father enough that's what we got wrong in this so they went to the ball game and she called me afterward excitedly describing the outing with her dad things had been a little strained at first she said but the afternoon had passed peacefully and there had even been moments of fun and laughter she felt they had taken a solid step towards restoring their relationship Like, even also that, like, so much of this burden is putting put on the daughter, it sounds like, for the difficult and painful feelings that come with your parents getting divorced. Like, it's natural to feel upset, but obviously we don't know the full story, so. I suggested that a next, that a good next step would be for her to find something that she could praise her dad for or thank him for the next time they were together. She thanked him for reaching out to her, and she told him, I like it when you call to talk to me. As she has kept her focus on honoring her father and looking for ways to be positive and praise him, their communication has gotten better. And although the situation is still challenging, by demonstrating an attitude of love and respect, she's helping their relationship improve. Again, I hate that this young girl has so much of the burden of fixing her relationship with her father just by virtue that he's the parent and deserves to be re respected that is the child that you hurt by breaking up the family and even if it was best for the family he has a responsibility in making that relationship better more so than the child does right children don't ask to be born that's another thing like this my god this whole chapter is just that like i definitely think you should honor and respect your parents absolutely he, i'm not gonna say that you should not but there's this like unwarranted like i don't know kids don't ask to be born kids don't ask to be born period like i don't know in many ways you owe your kids more than they owe you at least in the beginning in my opinion like for as young as these people sound if you're going through a tough time in your relationship with one or both of your parents is strained, we hope you'll ask God to give you the wisdom and the courage to do your part in making a difference. Show love and respect. Look for opportunities to express gratefulness for the sacrifices they make as parents and avoid being critical. Pray that God will replace the negative character qualities in both you and your parent with the opposite character traits and then watch for times when you can put those qualities to work. I'm definitely praying for God to give me a softer heart in terms of being able to let things go, but I don't think I have to forgive my father. Crucial communication. 
Love and respect are important in our family and in every family, but those qualities don't always come automatically. When you see the Duggar family on television happily having adventures at home and around the country, it may seem like we never have disagreements or that we kids never get upset with each other or with mom or dad, but we're human. Sometimes siblings irritate us. We get our feelings hurt. We get disappointed when things don't turn out the way we expected them to. When those situations occur, our parents have shown us by their own example ways to resolve them so that our relationships with each other aren't damaged. We'll talk more about how we resolve disputes with our siblings in the next chapter. In this section, we want to share the ways we relate to our parents. Yes, we know. Thank you, girls. For Duggar kids, that begins with how we talk to and with mom and dad. Like most families, our parents desire that their relationship with us is one of love and mutual respect. Mom and dad also emphasize that they are there for us whenever we're going through a tough time and need someone to share our heart with. They've made it clear they can they've made it clear that we can always come to them and tell them anything and they'll be there and listen. And if need be to give us counsel. They understand that sometimes girls just need to talk to someone but don't necessarily want a five-step solution to fix everything. This is a fact, I'm sorry. Many times we just want someone to listen to what's going on in our lives. Oh my God, that used to be the most annoying thing with like just dating like my ex and just like men in general, I noticed that if you tell a man a problem, he wants to solve it for you. And sometimes it's just like, I don't really want a solution to this. I'm just really annoyed and need to talk about it. We are reminded that the book of Proverbs is full of parents saying to their children in various ways, my son, my daughter, give me your heart, hear my counsel, listen to my instruction. In communicating with our parents about the challenges and struggles we're facing, we have found that they walk through similar experiences in their own youth and can share personal stories, encouragement, and advice on how to get through these difficult times. I, Ginger, went through a couple different stages when talking with mom and dad was both challenging and healing. The first was when I was about five years old and we were living in a rented house near Little Rock while dad was serving in the legislator there. One evening, while dad was driving the hour-long commute home from work, a tornado warning was issued for our area. Mom and grandma nestled all his kids into the bathtub and we huddled there, praying and singing hymns as the tornado roared by a neighborhood not too far from ours. For a long time after that, I was fearful of death and of storms. There were many, many nights when I would wake mom and dad up in the middle of the night, worrying that another storm would come and kill us all, or kill me, or kill them and leave us kids to fend for ourselves. Our parents have always encouraged us to come to them any time, day or night, when we're frightened or having troubling thoughts. After the Josh shit, they were like, yes, doors open. <laughs> Daddy says some nights they have a full and overflowing room full of Duggars. When I would go to, I kind of hate that sentence. Daddy says some nights they have a full and overflowing room of Duggars. I feel like that would have been a better sentence compared to Daddy says some nights they have a full and overflowing room full of Duggars. But anyway, I'm not a book editor. I don't know. When I would go to my parents with my fears, they would snuggle me into their arms and reassure me. They would encourage me to look to God by quoting the words of David from Psalms. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalms 56 verse 3. Then they would pray with me and remind me of other Bible verses that promise God's love and care for us, such as God's promise, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13 verse 5. Eventually, I would go back to bed and sleep soundly. Now, when I meet a little girl who's afraid of storms, I tell her I used to be afraid too, and I'd run to my parents' bedroom, just as she's probably doing when those thunders, when the thunder rolls and the lightning crackles. 
and I tell her what my parents encouraged me to do every time I felt afraid, they would suggest that I focus on those reassuring Bible verses I'd memorized, such as Psalms 23, and that I shift my focus away from myself and my fears by praying for someone else who might be going through a scary or difficult time. This is the weirdest bit of advice I've ever heard in my life. Like, to say... I'm scared, but let me pray for somebody who's in a worse situation so I can feel better because it could be worse. Like, I don't know. I think that's really weird advice, personally. But okay. I grew out of my fear. Like, don't you guys think that's kind of weird advice? Like, I don't know. This whole joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. I grew out of my fear of storms just in time to hit another difficult bump in the road. It came when I was turning 13 and entering the tough stage so many girls endure somewhere between 12 and 16. You're no longer a little girl, but you're not quite a woman. The hormones kick in. You suddenly notice boys. Confusing thoughts are zipping through your mind and sometimes lies fill your head telling you things like, I'm ugly or I'm never going to get a guy. The lies in your head can seem random and constant, making you think you have to look a certain way or act a certain way. Self-acceptance becomes a major issue. You want to change your looks, your friends, your personality, everything. You want desperately to appear like a super cool teenager, but at the same time you feel yourself inwardly spiraling downward into an endless well of self-doubt. I want to ask that. Girls who were cool in high school, what was it like? to just get it, to just be it, to be that girl. Like, what was that feeling like? To not be lame. Obviously, like, I gotta find a picture of me in high school. Like, I was okay. I wasn't a loser, but by no means was I cool. When I was in this stage, I went to my parents many a night, or I would confide in mom during the day, sharing my worries or doubts about myself. My parents responded with unwavering love and encouragement. Dad would say, Ginger, as long as you keep talking, you'll be okay. You'll get through this. It's a season of your life, and things will get easier as you grow in your relationship with God. Mom reminded me that when Jesus was tempted, he quoted scripture. He wrote out verses. She wrote out verses for me to memorize from Romans 6 and other passages so that when the doubts or fears could sneak in, I could push them aside with assurances and truths from God's word. As a family, we also memorized Ephesians 6 verse 10 through 20 because it talks about the armor and weapons that we as Christians have to use against the attacks of Satan. I think that's like one of Stephen Hassan's like bite things. Like if you are simplifying very deep and complicated things like... It's like if you're like over trying to oversimplify things that are in fact really deep and complicated and like shifting away from negative thoughts or negative ideas. Because I know I feel like Ginger's talking about teenage insecurity in terms of like your appearance and how you feel about yourself, like self esteem and like how you perceive boys like you. But this isn't actually very good advice if you're feeling other doubts about like christianity and your parents faith like i'm thinking about this in the context of like when joy said she had she was having a difficult time in her teen years accepting her parents faith as her own like imagine like you have those kinds of questions and your parents are this is the advice that they're giving you about how to change your focus like oh that you're being selfish to think those things um you know pray for others You know, oh, here, read this Bible verse, read this Bible verse, focus on this versus whatever negative thought you're having. And just even the idea of like what a negative thought might be or a negative feeling. Like, I don't know. I don't want to be nitpicky because I do think that is a bad advice when you're feeling insecure as a teenager about your physical appearance, about boys, um, to have something positive that changes your mind about why you don't need to worry about those things, why you don't, why you shouldn't feel insecure. Like, I don't think that that's bad advice, but I feel like this is kind of a slippery slope. 
Mom also encouraged me to choose a prayer target and suggested that anytime I was tempted by negative thoughts or by worries and fears, I could use that as a springboard to pray for someone I knew who needed God's salvation or just needed to draw closer to him. She gave me a great mental exercise. Every time the devil tries to tempt you to be fearful, to believe lies about yourself, or to get consumed with boy thoughts, take the focus off yourself by quoting God's word and praying for someone else. Satan definitely doesn't want you praying, so eventually he'll back off. Like, I don't know, again, that's just kind of weird advice to me to say, like, I'm feeling really insecure looking in the mirror. Let me go and pray for the starving kids in Yemen right now. I mean, like, I guess. I don't know. What do you guys think? Like, (laughs) I don't know. Personally, when I'm starting to feel, like, anxious and anxiety and I, like, am feeling overwhelmed, like, I've been kind of having, like, a really emotionally heavy week this week. I don't know why, but I just have. I just kind of have and it does help to kind of feel like you know what i release this to god like i cannot be worried about the future i don't want to be worried about the past right now in my present i'm super grateful okay yeah right now i feel like you know just just it's in the present moment to be really grateful and to just say thank you god for the grace that i have right now in my life like all the things that i do have that it helps me to kind of calm down like you know that i that idea that like if you're anxious you're kind of living you're worried about the future like i don't have anxiety right i'm just kind of anxious um and worried so it helps to kind of focus on those things and focus on the things that you're grateful for focus on the hope that you have in god like the faith that things are going to get better and that you don't even have to like not to think about the future just to be kind of trusting walking in that that it is all going to work out like i do think that 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 is really super helpful and that has helped me but i think it's kind of weird i don't know to be like let me think about people who are worse off than me so i can be grateful when i feel like there's a way to kind of calm down and feel good in a way that does not mean you have to like be looking at somebody's grass that needs to be watered but I don't know. I just kind of think it's weird to say that I'm going to start thinking about somebody else. Like I'm being selfish. To, yeah, I, I guess it's my problem. Like it's being selfish almost or like to think about yourself and your own feelings right now about how you're feeling. It's like, yeah, that's how you feel, baby. That's how you feel. But uh, I digress. What do you guys think? Like, is that weird advice to you? Like I've never heard that before. Like mom... Like dad, mom also assured me that this stage would soon pass. One day when I was in the throes of self-doubt and tempted to let worrisome thoughts fill my mind, mom asked if it would be okay if she asked Jana to talk to me. I agreed. Jana opened up and shared about how during her teenage years, she had experienced many of the same struggles, and as she applied these same principles to her life, she was able to slowly get out of this same emotional rut. And so for context, Jana is four years older than Ginger. She said this emotional roller coaster affects a lot of teenage girls, but as you seek the Lord and grow in your relationship with him, you will be strengthened and these trials will slowly fade away. Mom knew that her and dad's reassurance was helpful, but to hear it from an older sister who had been the same stage not too long ago was even more powerful. Proverbs 19 verse 20 tells us to hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise. I listened to mom's and Jana's counsels and the troubling thoughts soon lessened. Heart to heart talks. Mom and dad don't just say, you can talk to us anytime, and leave it at that. In addition to daily striving to keep up with our hearts, they also set a time, usually on one Saturday a month, specifically for heart-to-heart family time. It's a dedicated time when each of us kids, one after another, spends time with them talking one-on-one, typically either in their bedroom or in the room we call our prayer closet. Sometimes we talk with mom, sometimes with dad, or sometimes with both together. Often to help get the conversation going, they'll ask us questions. They let us know that they are a safe place to share things, that we can tell them anything no matter how hard it may be for them to hear. Gee, I wonder why they 
made up that rule. So far, they've, so far, if they've been shocked by something we've said, they haven't shown it. And we know they will keep our issues private unless we agree they can share them with a sibling, like mom did when Ginger needed encouragement from Jana. As dad said, they're not going to announce our worries or misdeeds as public prayer requests next Sunday at church, unless it's Joshua, apparently. Since our parents have a 24-hour open door policy, we sometimes come in at midnight, even 2 a.m., just to talk or share our heart. If we come in too late, things can get a bit entertaining. Dad sometimes finds it hard to stay awake. It's not a matter of interest, but after all, it's 2 a.m. And even the Duggars are usually asleep by then. That's when Mom might have to give him a gentle nudge and say, Jim, Bob, wake up. We're still talking here. At the beginning of a heart-to-heart talk, Mom and Dad might start by asking, How are you doing? Often we respond with a simple, okay, and of course, most parents can discern whether that means good or not so good. From time to time, they might ask us other simple questions about our favorite food, restaurant, candy, coffee, ice cream, board game, color, music, clothes, and more. These questions aren't just meant as icebreaker chit-chat. Mom takes notes. She may have 19 kids, but she wants to know every one of us in detail. Inevitably, depending on the age of the child, the questions vary from have you been kind to your sibling when playing for younger kids into how's your thought life going for an older one. Because what the hell does that mean? Then, depending on which child they're talking with, they might pick a couple of different questions from this list to ask during talk time. One. Who's your best friend? What qualities do you admire in him or her? Does this friendship tend to build you up or pull you down? Two, what do you want to do with your life? Whom do you want to be like? What skills do you want to develop? Do you wonder what God's will is for your life? Three, what books are you reading? What interests you in the book and how has it influenced you? Have you ever thought about writing a book? What topic would you write about? You might have guessed our answer to these last questions. Four, what things in our family discourage you? Clutter, conflicts with siblings, lack of space, rules when others get into your stuff. Five, what changes would you like to see in us, mom and dad? More time spent with the family, greater spiritual leadership. Six, what projects are you working on now? Who or what are you praying for? Career training, mentoring others. Seven, What things about yourself or past would you like to change? Eight, if you could ask God any question, what would you ask him? Nine, what things can I pray about for you? These questions have changed over time, and of course the questions they ask depend on the age of the child having the heart-to-heart talk. Growing up with this kind of communication builds trust, and we feel the freedom to share our deepest thoughts, hopes, fears, and failures with our parents. Now, so what do you guys think? Would you have found that kind of thing helpful from your parents? Like, to some extent, I mean, is it safe to assume that parents just know you like that? Like, if you're a child, I don't have kids, clearly. Um, I do want them someday, so, like, I'm definitely interested in, in wondering. Like, I don't know. I think that is beneficial to have those kind of conversations about your child because just because you think you know something about your kid, they might perceive themselves completely different, right? You might think, oh, my kid watches Paw Patrol every day. That's their favorite show. And they tell you, oh, no, I like, God, what are the kids watching today? I don't have children. (laughs) I know Paw Patrol. I know, is it Sophie's Corner? I think I'm mixing up um, Sophie's Choice with there's this black girl on YouTube who has like a channel, who has like a, oh my God, I can't remember, but I 
Maybe I'll put it in. <laughs> but like, you know, or like my favorite show is Peppa, and they come and tell you my favorite show is Peppa Pig or something like that. There we go. You know, so I feel like those kinds of conversations are helpful. Definitely, I mean, those are good things to ask your kids, right? Those are good things to want to know. Do you guys think it's weird that they have like these lines of questions? I mean, Michelle has 19 children. Can we like, let's say congrats on, on trying, you know what I mean? I say all the time that I don't really like when people say that they don't know their kids because of how many there are. And the reason why is like, I don't know, being in elementary school, you were pro- if you went to a public school, you were probably in a school with about 18 to 20 other kids, right, at any given t- time. And to some extent, your teacher does get to know you. But at the same time, it's true. How well do they really get to know you? Even though they're spending a lot of time with you, they're spending a whole year with you. And I would say like in the past, I've thought about it in the sense that like because they're that Michelle is kind of in that situation. And but rather than getting a new class every year, you get the same kids every single year that that gives you an opportunity to know them better than the average teacher. But Kids are different every year, right? They change every year. They change every day, every season. Like, oh, this is my favorite color now. This is my favorite show now. This is what I'm reading now. Oh, I'm not interested in that at all. And I think about the things and intentional conversations that I've had with like maybe my mother or father. And I can't say necessarily that I have. Like I can't, I I would be interested in what my mother would say from my childhood were my favorite things besides reading and even that I would ask her so what do you think were my favorite books you know so I can say well I remember my favorite childhood movies were because those are still my favorite childhood movies like to to this day I could watch Um, I know Cinderella like Disney's Cinderella word for word I know that movie word for word I used to watch it like back to back three times a day rewind the tape oh my goodness a favorite 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 the Anastasia movie I'm obsessed with and that ta- that Anastasia and her family to this day. And I remember I like wore out that tape. That's how much I watched it. And I wonder if that's something that my mother knows about me. And I wonder if that would be the kind of thing that Michelle Duggar would be able to say about one of her kids. So, but whose responsibility is it? We know that this family tradition of ours is pretty unusual. Maybe in your family, there's no way parents and kids can spend a whole day talking one-on-one. And actually having a set day for family talk time may be ideal, but it's not our parents' primary goal. Their priority is that we maintain open communication at all times. Maybe you'd like to have this kind of open relationship with your parents, but you feel awkward suggesting it or just don't know how to make it happen. And even if your parents do set aside time for heart-to-heart talks with you, we know you may not find it easy to respond. That's what happened when I, Jessa, was about 13. About that time, I started thinking if my parents really cared about me, they would be able to see what that something is troubling me and they'd help me work through it. And I don't feel like that's an unfair thing to think that your parents should be able to recognize within your behavior that something is wrong. But but as much as I knew mom and dad loved me, and as hard as they tried to let me know they were there for me, they didn't ask the ideal, quote-unquote, ideal question, whatever that was, that would have opened the floodgates. Ever been there? Thinking your parents just don't understand you? When that happens, it's easy for walls of bitterness and hurt to rise up. As you sink deeper into your self-absorbed thinking and start believing your parents just aren't there for you when they when you need them most, the truth is they're probably much more there for you than you realize, but you may be stuck in a mindset that makes you think it's their responsibility to figure out what's going on with you, when most likely you can't even figure it out yourself. It finally dawned on me one day, that the key was for me to take the responsibility in initiating the conversation and that it was my responsibility to respond honestly to their questions when they tried to have a heart-to-heart talk. 
Instead of giving superficial answers to their questions, I attempted to be more thorough and open with my answers. But the change was hard. While I really wanted to be honest, I also didn't want to bother them with everything, so I still held some stuff back. That meant those issues built up and up and up until by the time I finally decided to open up to my parents, I felt almost like I was in a a quote-unquote crisis situation. I would be so stressed that I couldn't get my thoughts into words and then I would begin to worry. What are my parents going to think about me if I share this with them? What will others think if they find out? Would I be better off not saying anything? My parents reassured me that nothing I would ever say or do could change their love for me or to Josh. Their love is unconditional. They also encouraged me to try and get everything off of my heart. Mom compared it to getting a splinter in your foot. Unless you get all of it out, it will continue to cause you pain and can even become infected. Removing a splinter may be somewhat painful at first, but that is the only way to get long-term relief and bring healing. That's actually a very good analogy. Uh, Michelle, kudos. I agree. I would say. Like a very, this, this very good even relationship advice. Like, you know, get that off your chest or else it's going to hurt forever. Though I don't believe closure is a real thing, but... I finally shared a small thing just to see how they would react. Then a little more and a little more until it all came pouring out in a rush of sobs and jumbled up phrases. After I shared, I felt so free inside, almost like a huge burden was lifted off my shoulders. This was one of the hardest things I had ever done, but it brought peace and strengthened my relationship with my parents. All of those fears that held me back from talking had almost kept me from experiencing one of the most wonderful feelings in the world, a clear conscience. I hate that that's where this story basically stops. Like, girl, what were you worried about? Why were you crying like that? I want to know the tea. Is that not why I'm reading this book? Is that not why you asked me to pay $21.99? Which, obviously, I did not pay for this book. But, still. All of us girls have realized that if we end up crying when we're talking to mom and dad, and Jill and Ginger are now the most likely to, to cry, which I think it's interesting that the two daughters who have probably drifted the furthest away from their parents orbit would be the ones most likely to cry in their presence it's usually because we've waited too long to share the concerns of our hearts after several heart-to-heart meltdowns i jessa have gotten better at opening up and talking about things that trouble me with mom and dad before the problems build up that's not to say it's always easy but the blessings and sense of freedom that come with being completely open and honest are wonderful It means we feel understood by our parents inside and out, and we know without a doubt that they accept us and love us unconditionally. It's a sign of increasing maturity when a young person begins to develop these communication skills. Being open can spare many of us troubles later on, as so many issues in adult life are a direct result of miscommunication or non-communication. And I do think that's very true. Um... I feel like that's a lot of my problems, like from being really introverted and quiet. I would say that's one of my biggest 2022 New Year's resolutions is wanting to be more transparent with people and that in an attempt to spare other people's feelings, I end up just hurting my own when it's like, you know what, I might as well let you sit with that discomfort and just deal with what that has to look like on your face rather and the moment of being uncomfortable right now while you experiencing it rather than carrying it around with me so i do think that's very good advice and that a lot of problems in this life are from not having good communication or miscommunication or not being very transparent and clear with people at the appropriate time that you need to instead of letting it build up letting it be brushed under the rug until it does bubble up and turn into something that is burdensome but in terms of a relationship with your parent I don't think everybody has the opportunity to have this kind of relationship with their parents where their parents will be like, oh, you can come to me with anything and I'm going to love you unconditional. You know what I mean? Like, that's just not always realistic. But I get we're trying to do. This book is not only meant to sell us. Like, this book is meant to also try and encourage people's parents to behave how the darker parents act. It's almost like this book is meant for you to be like longing. Oh, I wish I had Michelle and Jim Bob type parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
It's like you niggas.